Good evening. Um, it is a great joy to be worshipping with you all this Lord's Day evening. Could you turn with me to Judges chapter 6? I'm going to be reading the whole passage, so it's all 40 verses. Let us begin. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the tabernacle at Ophrah which belongs to Joash the Abezerite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the wondrous deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us, and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I find favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come and bring you out my presence and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from the ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket, the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the tabernacle and presented it to them. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and he touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abizarites. The night the Lord, that night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and put down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold there, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down and the Asherah beside it was cut down and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son, 
that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore on that day Gideon was called Jerubal, that is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down his altar. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed Jordan and encamped the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and he sounded the trumpet and the Abizrites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout Manasseh and they too were called to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun and Naphtali and they went up to meet them. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only. And on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. And let us pray. Oh, gracious God, you have bestowed on your people immeasurable gifts, gifts that we did not even know we needed. And yet now we can come into your presence, we can hear your word. We who are sinners have been made clean and new by the washing of blood. We pray that you would open our hearts to this word, this gift you have given us this day, Lord, that we may be strengthened and encouraged. And that our spirits would rise up and glorify your great name and response today and all through the days going forward. Amen. The title of my sermon is The Grace We Need. And I don't have slides, so I just thought I'd let you guys know that. But life is quite difficult, especially when you're an adult. It's filled with loads of responsibility. And at some point, everybody faces some kind of hardship or another. I remember the moment I came to this realization. I was still quite young. I was 18 and a student, and I just moved out the house. I got a monthly allowance, but I lived in Pretoria, which was about four hours away from home. And with that allowance, I needed to take care of all my living needs, the water, electricity, um, food, all of those sorts of things. And as far as I was concerned, I was an adult, because I decided how to spend my time and how to spend my money. And it was bliss. Me and my friends could go out whenever we wanted. We could eat whatever we wanted. I finally had freedom at last. But our two weeks into my first month, the unthinkable happened. I went to the shop to get some groceries, and when I swiped my card, it said transaction declined insufficient funds. And there were still two more weeks left. There was only a bit of rice and some frozen veggies in the fridge. And so it seemed like a disaster, but I'm not a child anymore. I'm 18. I know exactly what to do when things get difficult. I've learned by now. I call my mom. Because for the last 18 years, every time life brought trouble, I could depend on my parents to get us out of it. And so I gave her a call. I told her, you know, I'm new to this whole living on my own thing. I've been irresponsible. I've run out of money. I need help. I'm willing to accept all the punishments I need. You know, that whole story. And I won't forget her response. She said, that sucks, my boy. It's best you budget next month. Yes, that's right. She left her beloved son to starve. I was left alone. Life was hard. But I didn't starve, just in case she's watching. Um, and I think she knew that. I survived till the end of the month, eating pretty much just rice and a bit of frozen veggies. And I got through the semester, but I was still a little bit sore about being abandoned. 
And what made things worse was when I got home, everyone was acting normal as if I'd never been left for dead to begin with. But I didn't want to start a fight with them immediately because they pay the bills. Um, so at some point, I just was sitting with my mom and I made the comment, remember that time that I was in deep trouble, I ran out of money and you left me to survive on my own and how cold it was? But then she asked me, did you ever run out of money again? And to which I responded, of course not. You don't know what that was like. I ate rice every day for two weeks. I will never, ever let that happen again. And now with hindsight, I've come to realize that she did in fact help me. It just wasn't the help I wanted. She gave me the help that I needed. My problem wasn't where's my next meal coming from, but rather why am I so bad with money? In our text today, we find Israel in a very similar situation. Times are really tough, really, really tough. And like a needy child, they are crying out to God to deliver them once again. And because God is so gracious, he doesn't just come and take away their immediate problems, but rather he gives them the help they need. And so I've divided my, four, my text into four points tonight around this idea. A desperate situation and the response they needed, the unlikely hero we need, the solution we need, and the assurance we need. So let's start with the first one, this desperate situation and the response they needed. The passage begins with a very familiar tale by now in Judges. We've seen the cycle played out numerous times. Israel's done what, evil, what is evil in the sight of the Lord. They're given over to their enemies. It's the Midianites this time. Um, you might have also noticed every single time so far, it's been a different clan that's oppressed them. It's, it's slowly moving around Israel. And they cry out to the Lord. And again, you would expect God is now going to raise up a judge and deliver Israel. But this time, the situation has actually gotten far worse. Each time, it seems to be degrading. And now it's gotten really bad. Spiritually, Israel is a mess. They'd forsaken the one true God. They were offering sacrifices to the false god Baal, um, which is something they did in earlier in Numbers, and Midian was actually complicit in that. And they'd even set up altars all around Israel to regularly practice this idolatry. A household as insignificant as Gideon's had an altar to Baal. That, that should tell us how common this practice was all over Israel. And politically, they were on the brink of collapse. In only seven years, Midian had reduced this nation to their knees. They'd plundered all their crops year after year, that there were no livestock left in the land, and they'd reduced this powerful nation of Israel to a group of desperate cave dwellers, hiding with what little food they could, hoping to survive. And so they cry out to the Lord, just as their ancestors had done before, hoping for some reprieve, but rather he sends a prophet this time. The, the, the judge they wanted doesn't come immediately. And this prophet tells him how it's their own sin that brought them here. Notice the prophet also doesn't give a solution. He doesn't say, oh, I'm going to now do this. He merely states what's wrong. And at first this seems a bit of a bizarre response, and, and it's meant to be. It's meant to actually catch the reader's attention. It's kind of like if your car broke down, and you called roadside assistance, and instead of sending a tow, tow truck, they sent some guy, and he stood on the side of the road and shouted, behold, your engine has seized because you failed to change the oil. You know, you'd be like, this isn't really a solution, it's just information. It, it's, it's striking. And Israel was probably extremely despondent with this prophet's message. When they got this message, they realized deliverance doesn't look like it's coming. All hope is lost. But this kind of tough love message was exactly what they needed. Because they've been delivered from their enemies before, but every single time they just fall right back into idolatry. Their problem was a sin problem, not a Midian problem. And I want to be a bit careful here now, just as a side note. The text is not saying that every single time we face hardships in our life, it's a result of some sin, known or unknown. As if when we struggle, we need to now go and find the sin in our life, you know, possibly secret sin, and eradicate it. And if we can't find the sin, we're doomed to suffer forever. This is a despicable doctrine. 
often taught in prosperity circles, and it causes much pain in the church. It is true God will use hardships and suffering to discipline us when we sin, but this isn't a hard and fast rule. He can just as easily punish our sin with prosperity and cause us to be blind to our own sin. Our physical situation doesn't always indicate where we are spiritually. He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And so the text here is not talking about some kind of rule that happens every time without fail. But rather it's describing events within a specific context. And the context is Israel's covenant with God, where he gives them peace and prosperity in the land if they obey his commandments and never forsake him. Don't worship the gods of the land you are going to. You can read about this covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And not only had Israel broken the covenant, but they were continually breaking the covenant. They were still worshiping Baal at the same time crying out to God for help. This was not them turning back to God. They weren't being sincere and genuine and saying we really need to go back to God. It was, it was routine religious behavior. It was just a ritual that they were hoping to get some kind of result from. And God is now pointing out their spiritual deadness, pointing them back to their sin. They don't need a military victory, but they need to earnestly start seeking the Lord again. And for us, I believe this is where the application lies. It's a reminder that we need to earnestly seek the Lord. We need to check our hearts. When we spend time in the Word for our daily devotion, are we genuinely seeking to hear His voice? Or is it something we do so that we can mark the day off on our Bible app? And when we pray, are we seeking to petition Him and find His will? Or is it just a routine before bed? And, and same with worship. As we gather here, are we eagerly coming for our souls to be nourished and fed as we praise and glorify His name? Or is it just part of a routine attendance that we do at the end of every week? Let us stop and consider the earnestness with which we seek Him. God hates empty worship. He says, bring no more vain offerings. Incest is an abomination to me. Isaiah chapter 1. So check your heart, brothers and sisters. Make sure your acts are in earnest. And if you find your resolve is weakening, weakening and you're just doing these things out of routine, cry out to the Lord. Ask Him to restore your first love. Pray to Him in earnest. As Matthew prayed earlier, that we don't just come here and do this week in and week out, but that we earnestly seek Him. God provides us with the grace we need. And we actually see this unfolding in the rest of the next chapter. It, it's a series of, of gracious acts where God gives Israel what they need after calling them back to see their sin. And so let's look now from verse 11, and my second point, the hero we need. In verse 11, it, it cuts to another scene where God appears in a theophany as the angel of the Lord. And, and as I've said, the rest of the account is now God's gracious response to the problem Israel finds themselves in. And as I mentioned before, the prophet didn't give Israel a solution to the situation. And usually, you know, if we read the other prophets, the major and minor prophets, after the line, you have not obeyed my voice, we would expect to hear some kind of punishment or consequence. Now I'm going to do this and that or the next thing. But in this case, the author just cuts to this new scene, to the calling of Gideon. Instead of punishment, God is now graciously revealing how he's providing the hero they need to come and save Israel. And so the angel of the Lord comes and greets Gideon. And he, he says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon has all kinds of problems with this statement. Firstly, he's skeptical of, of the first bit. You know, consider his situation. He's busy hiding his grain in a wine press so it doesn't get stolen. As he prepares to spend the rest of the harvest season hiding in the stronghold or cave, hoping not to starve to death. You know, you know naturally he looks at these problems and he asks, where is God in all of this? These are not the good old days of my ancestors, where he led them out of Egypt. And he's not accusing God of wrongdoing here. 
but he's deducing from the message the prophet gave and the suffering that Israel's enduring that God has abandoned them. Um, you know, it's something God had every right to do and, and something Gideon probably thought was the logical consequence of the prophet's message. And the angel doesn't rebuke Gideon and say, how dare you question that God is not with you anymore, but rather he reminds Gideon. He says, God is now sending you, Gideon, to save Israel. But Gideon also has a problem with this because he's the one getting sent and he's no mighty man of valor. He's an insignificant person who's a coward from the weakest clan in the smallest tribe of a decimated Israel. How can he stand against nations that, whose camels and, and armies cannot be numbered, which is what the text says? What could he possibly accomplish? But what he didn't realize was that this is exactly the person God uses to do these great things. When he called Moses, Moses also felt incapable to the task. And when he made a covenant with David, David answered by saying, who am I that you have brought me this far? far? This is a common theme in scripture. It's a common theme in judges. Othniel, the first judge, was an old man and, and not fit for leadership in that sense. Ehud had a deformity of his arm and was not fit to be this mighty valiant leader. Deborah was a woman, and now Gideon, this man of low estate, is being called. This is what God does. His low estate is exactly what is needed because it's the perfect vessel to show that it's actually the hand of God moving. His insignificance is probably the only thing he brings to the table. This is how God works. And so he's assured by those comforting words, I will be with you. Again, a common refrain that rings across the pages of Scripture. God is with him. This isn't about Gideon saving Israel. God is saving Israel, and he's using lowly Gideon. And again, we don't have to be the most gifted evangelist or most eloquent speaker or most talented person or whatever else we think is important to have a positive and good impact in the kingdom of God. This idea that the church can only benefit if it's filled with the best and brightest and most talented people is just untrue. God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. If you feel like your ability or, or lack thereof is holding you back from serving in a local church, it isn't. If you have a heart to serve, get stuck in. If you feel like you don't have anything significant to add, even better, his strength will be more readily on display in your weakness because he is with you. We can have great impact. The Lord will use us. We don't need to first develop some brilliant skill. So I would encourage you, get stuck in. And, and it is hard and we will be doubtful. Gideon was doubtful here. He was still unsure. And so he asked for a sign. And we must remember now, Gideon doesn't know he's talking to God. He probably thinks this is a prophet by now. And so when he asks for a sign, he's preparing a meal as a kind of assurance or, or offering. You know, He's going to bring it to the prophet. The prophet's going to eat the meal. And when, when this man of God eats the meal, it'll be a sign that God is with him. You know, he wants assurance that God is with him. The man of God is on his side, so God is on his side. But when the food is brought, instead of eating it, it's consumed with fire. And Gideon is overcome with fear. It's ironic. He realizes that God was actually in his presence, which is what he wanted a sign of, that God is with him. And now that he realizes God is actually, in fact, with him, he is terrified. A and he should be terrified. There's an altar to Baal just down the road at his house. He was worshiping a false god. God should have struck him down. He deserved to die. And this is why he was terrified. This idea of the fear of God is often lost on us New Covenant believers. Um, we take the idea of access to God as something for granted. And Dale Ralph Davis puts it this way. He says, we often think of intimacy with God as our right rather than in the indescribable gift. There is nothing about 
amazing about grace as long as there is nothing fearful about holiness. The idea of God abandoning Israel now melts away at the reality of him being there among the Israelites because he should smite every single one of them. He is the holy and righteous God who is jealous and he has commanded them not to worship other gods and now he is there and they have done what he has said they should not do. But he doesn't smite them. He doesn't strike them down. He is a gracious God. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. And he is there to deliver them. He is the hero they need. Because it wasn't Moses who brought them out of Egypt. It wasn't David who defeated Goliath. It was God using these weakened and imperfect, using these weakened and imperfect vessels. And now he is graciously doing it again. And so he tells Gideon, do not fear. I am with you. And then he sends him on his mission. This is my third point, the solution we need. As we see from the get-go, the primary mission of Gideon is not the conquest of Midian, but rather the destruction of Baal worship. Defeating the Midianites would only be treating the symptom. The real problem is that they had abandoned God. If they fix that, the Midianite problem will come later. God is a jealous God. He is a holy God. And His holiness should be feared. Idolatry brings His wrath. He's rescuing Israel from their idolatry. First, not Midian first. He's providing the solution that they need, not the one they want. You know, if we go back to the broken down car illustration, it's like roadside assistance sending somebody to come and replace your engine instead of sending a tow truck. Because tomorrow you're going to need to get around and your car is of no value if it's on a tow truck. You would still be stuck. It would be a better solution. And likewise, now, God chasing the Midianites away doesn't fix Israel's problem. They will still be worshipping Baal. In Matthew 6, tells us that nobody can serve two masters. There can only be one master of Israel. It is either the God of the Bible or Baal. It cannot be both. We either have true worship or false worship, not a mixture of the two. And, you know, maybe you're thinking now, lucky we're safe, we live in an enlightened time, people don't bow down to statues anymore, so we don't need to worry. I, I would say think again. Matthew 6 is not talking about a statue, it's talking about money. And Romans 1 tells us of man forsaking God for created things. All of creation, anything can become an idol, even good things. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure will lie. Your heart can draw you away to idols. As John Calvin famously said, the human heart is an idol factory. And so we need to regularly search our hearts. We need to look where it truly lies. We need to consider are our affections being drawn away by idols? Are these created things stealing our affections from God? And when we find them, we need to tear them down. We need to take what we were giving these idols, our time, our money, our affection, and we need to redevote them to God. And this is what Gideon was told to do. There were two cows there. The, the first one was most likely a cow um, that was dedicated for Baal worship. And so Gideon took it away. And so taking away from Baal what was due him. And the second cow of seven years old would represent the seven years they were under Midian oppression. And God, the second cow was sacrificed while burning the Asherah pole. He was removing false worship from the land and replacing it with true worship. And some look at the text and complain that he did it at night like a coward. And this is true. It shows us that he was. He was a terribly fearful man and very reluctant to do these things. But on that, I would just say, better a coward who removes his idols in the dark than a brave man who lets them stand. The God gave him an instruction and he obeyed it. That's what matters. And he had good reason to be afraid as well. I mean, when the people saw what he had done, they wanted to kill him. And this is because dealing with idolatry is always difficult. People hate it. Why do you think so many churches refuse to talk about things like money 
or politics when the Bible says so much on these things. And it's not just these two things. It can be anything, gender roles, entertainment, security, comfort. The list can go on and on and on. The human heart is an idol factory. Our heart manufactures these things, these things at a rate that we can't even comprehend. And people get angry when you try and bring down these things that they value the most. It isn't nice addressing these things. This is one of the reasons we do expository preaching here at, at this church, because we're forced to talk about these hard things. Because when the Bible talks about it, we then have to address it. So if the preacher is saying something that offends you, don't get angry, but consider that maybe the Word of God is now confronting your idolatry. And that this Word is now helping you. It's empowering you. It's emboldening you. Because idols are useless. They serve no purpose. And without them, we're way better equipped to serve in the kingdom. Our, our, our minds and our hearts are not distracted from these trivial things that will fade and fall. Then, and this is what we see here. After Gideon's father wisely explains to the people that if Baal is so great, why can't he save himself? You know, they let him live. They were unhappy, and so they gave him a name to say, like, Baal will contend with him. But when the Midianites and the Amalekites assemble for their annual plundering again now, we see something very different. We see Gideon, clothed by the Spirit, rallying the forces. He's a changed man. From a coward who was doing things in the dark and hiding behind his father, and this nobody from a small clan in the middle of nowhere, he's now valiantly rallying troops, calling people from other tribes, this is the power of the Spirit of God at work. The altars of Baal have been removed, and so now God's work can clearly be seen, working through His people. And similarly, as we rage on in our present ba battle, our spiritual battles, we can't afford to turn to created things for help. Our, our, our present idols, things that we may take comfort in, like, like medical science or or life insurance, or a strong, secure economy, ultimately they will fail us. They will lead us astray. Again, not bad things, but things that our hearts can turn into idols. We need to purge our hearts from these ideas. We need to rest wholly on the promises of God and realize that material things, whatever they are, will fall, will fade. This way we can, like Gideon, valiantly face the troubles that arise in our lives because we are empowered by the Spirit of God. We have the hero that we need. And while there are many times where we can feel like that, where we are riled up, where we, we're spiritually strong and we're bold and we can act in the strength, there are others where we will be weak, You know, where our hearts will doubt. The, our flesh overpowers us and this weakness comes through. But rest assured, because the Lord has given us exactly what we need. And this is my fourth point, the assurance we need. See, lastly, there's this little series of events regarding the fleece. Gideon is asking God for a sign uh, again. Now, we must pay careful attention here to the words. He uses the phrase, um, by my hand, as you have said, in verse 36 and verse 37. And what it indicates is that Gideon wants to be assured that God is going to, in fact, deliver Israel in this way. Gideon's already acted in faith. He's torn down the altars. He's rallied the people of Israel. He's not unbelieving. He doesn't disbelieve what God is saying and now asking God to prove himself yet again, you know, by way of testing the Lord. But rather he's hesitant. He's unsure. Is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? His faith is weak, and he's looking for an assurance, for a sign. It, it's more like a, I believe, help me in my unbelief kind of situation. Lord, help me here. I want to go. I've started this, but I'm hesitant. And again, this feeling may be very relatable for many of us Christians, these kinds of doubts that creep in. And these verses here... Um, don't show, like, they, they're not here to highlight Gideon's great unbelief now, like, oh, look how weak he is. No, rather, look again, look that God gives the sign. 
it shows us that God is gracious, that He's willing to come down and give us the signs our weakened faith needs. He gives us our assurances. How comforting is that? How gracious is this holy God that we serve? And so often we see admission of weakness in the church as taboo, as if if people have any kinds of doubts or weakness of faith, we want to pretend it doesn't exist. Sometimes people are even afraid that this kind of weakness means that they may lose their salvation and so block it out completely. I, I've even heard this given as advice, and I, and I think it's foolish advice. If someone comes, they're like, my faith is really weak. Uh, don't worry, I have the solution. Don't have weak faith. You know, this is not helpful advice. You know, Let me tell you something. Spurgeon and Luther had doubts, and they struggled with doubts tremendously. Thomas, who lived, and s- lived with and saw the Lord Jesus Christ, he doubted. And Christ was happy to show him the scars, to assure him of these things. A weakened faith is not enough to cost you your salvation. Unfortunately, you don't have the power to undo that. Then God will give us the strength and assurances we need. He gave Gideon the sign. And let's look at the sign because I think it's significant and it points us to this assurance. It's exactly the sign we all need. M- let me explain. In much of Palestine, especially during um, the early autumn and late summer, the dew would fall very heavily in place of the rain. It was the dew that nourished the land. And so the idea of dew became synonymous with God's g- grace and His blessing. We see the, the term, the dew of heaven, appear in the text of scripture very often and barrenness or the removal of dew was synonymous with barrenness and the removal of God's grace this is why when Isaac blessed Jacob he asked God to give him the dew of heaven and similarly Moses mentions dew as a blessing in Deuteronomy 33 and in the sign here we see the dew or the blessing of God on the fleece while the land remained barren and dry but the second time around And the more miraculous sign that that Gideon asked for, the dew now had gone onto the land, or the blessing had gone onto the land, and the fleece was dry, or the fleece had now taken that barrenness, that curse. See, this sign would have been incredibly encouraging and comforting to Gideon, because in his mind it symbolically represented that blessing is now coming to the land of Israel. And this is a sign of blessing from God for his people for all ages. Because tragically, we'll learn that in the coming weeks, even with Gideon in Israel, they still fall back into idolatry. He is not the ultimate leader that they needed. It was God. And the sign here points us to this eternal hope, to this great judge who will one day save all people. The sign of the fleece is is a type of Christ or a, a, a symbol or a foreshadowing. It points us to him very subtly because just like the fleece takes on the barrenness of the land and the blessing then goes out into the land of Israel, so Christ has taken on our sin and curse and he has freely distributed his grace to all in the church. What a glorious reminder this is for Christians of all ages. Andrew Fawcett says this of the sign. He says, this sign is admirably calculated to both confirm his faith and at the same time to assure the children of God in all ages that he will keep his promise of making perfect his strength in their weakness. And so this points forward to this great hope. And it assures us that even in our weak faith, God was gracious enough to come down to make his perfect strength known in that weakness. So if you're sitting here tonight, if you're watching online, maybe you struggle at times with doubt. Maybe this pandemic has really done a number on your faith. Your loved ones are dying all around us. Livelihoods are being lost. People are losing work. People are losing businesses. Life is really hard at the moment. Medical workers are, are put in tremendous danger day in and day out, struggling as they battle this. You know, maybe you're really struggling. You're struggling to hold on. And if so, I'd encourage you, cry out to the Lord. Ask Him to strengthen your faith. Ask Him to remind you of His signs. Ask Him for those signs. 
And I don't mean take a blanket and go put it on the grass and ask the dew to fall in, in a certain way. And we don't need that anymore. Because God, in His divine, sovereign will, has already provided the sign of assurance that we need. We don't need to look for new signs. He's given us one. One that points back to the same work of Christ that that one was pointing forward to. It's something we partook of this morning. It's the table, not this table, it was on the table. The communion, the elements. So we don't need to think up little tests and validate our assurance this way. God has provided the sign we need. And it's this sign is a better one. Del Ralph Davis again, he says, he has provided a table instead of a threshing floor and bread and wine in place of a fleece. See, that one pointed forward to the coming Savior. And now this one points us back to this great event, the greatest event in all of creation's history, where body was broken, where blood was shed on our behalf. And because of this, nothing Nothing can ever separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing ever, not even weak faith. So if we do grow weak, if we forget these wonderful truths, God has graciously given us the sign we need, the reminder of what has already been done. Brothers and sisters, do not neglect this sign. It is very significant. Don't take it lightly. It's not something we merely do some Sundays, it is a gloriously gracious gift from God, a sign given by Him, one that gives us great strength in our weakness, that gives us assurance and hope. I can personally attest to this. During this pandemic, during these difficult times, this has been one place I could come to and I can feel my faith being strengthened. So come to this table, cling to it. Use it to assure you and remind you that God has already delivered us. Be reminded that God is with us. He will never forsake us. He is the Savior that we need. He has provided the salvation that we need. He gives us the assurance we need. And His grace is all that we need. He will never forsake us. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God in heaven, how good you have been to your people. Lord, as we bring this evening to a close and we lift up our final song to you, Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit once more and you would stir our hearts and affections towards you. You would encourage us, Lord, and as we came around this table this morning, we seek to do so again in the coming weeks. We pray that you would remind your servants of its significance, that we would make efforts to do so, and that we would seek to cling to that blessed assurance that Jesus is ours.